Hi guys and welcome. Uh, just uh, to check things and make sure, uh, let me know if you can hear me okay on uh, the line here. I'm Tony Leonard, uh, sitting in on ZBrush Live for this. Uh, oh, sorry, hold on one sec. There we go, sorry about that. Give me one second and we'll begin. Hello again, folks. Uh, I'm Tony Leonard sitting in on this uh, June 29th, uh, Saturday afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, I'm very excited to be streaming today because I have a couple of things that I'd like to share with you guys, um, kind of in continuation to talks from last uh, time I streamed, for those who've been following. Um, and I'm eager to get excited uh, and started. Sorry. <laughs> so anyway, let's uh, let us begin. Uh, of, all, of course, as always, uh, let me know uh, on the chat if you guys can hear me okay, uh, and if you can see my screen. All right, I'm gonna probably switch over to my screen here and camera. There we go. And there we go. Hi guys, welcome. Happy Saturday. Hope everyone is having a good weekend, and uh, let's get it. Let's get after it. So, um, anyway, uh, last time around, I'm just gonna turn this down just a wee bit. There we go. All right. So I'm sure you guys can hear me okay. Uh, if not, do let me know in the Twitch. I'm trying to keep an eye on um, all of the conversations uh, between Facebook and. Also, uh, Twitch. Uh, for some reason, I can't get my restream started very good, so I might miss a, a, a question or two. But uh, bear with me. Uh, if you guys try to send me um, a message over uh, Facebook uh, and or through the chat on Twitch, I will of course try to answer everything promptly and uh, as I catch it, because I got another monitor I see you guys off to the side there but um, let me see here sorry there we go all right let me just make sure Everybody correct. For some reason I'm having a problem trying to see everybody on, on Facebook. Um, but let's get after it, um, as I said. Okay, so last time around I was building something of a walker mech and it, it didn't turn out so great. Um, I started off uh, with a good pace and then I had a crash and lost some data hate when that happens but uh, the good thing is you know you keep up um, what you're doing and you can sort of like you know learn from mistakes made or maybe take a different approach take a breath take a coffee take a walk uh, come back and once you're ready you get into you know starting to create something else so in the same vein um, using some of the same methods uh, as probably previously discussed in previous streams I've been using ZBrush a lot with um, you know in a combination with um, 
probably Maya a little bit. Uh, also, I shoot a lot of things over to Blender and do a lot of things in uh, Blender 2.8 EB. Uh, it's all also for rendering and um, also using the add-on box cutter, uh, which is part of uh, Team C, uh, are the makers of it. Uh, my buddy Jerry Perkins uh, and his crew uh, have coded some really cool tools for Blender that um, allow me to do some very advanced booleans, and then I bring those back to, to ZBrush and try to work them out into a model. So this is just um, something I wanted to show you guys just to, as a start. There's actually a couple of different projects that I've been working up since the last stream that I had that I'm going to try to combo it all within two hours today. Um, maybe might go over a few minutes uh, discussing things. But uh, if you guys have any questions uh, or you know are like, hey, well, how does this uh, lend itself to illustration um, as the title of the, the screen? So a lot of times what I do is I kind of deviate and try to show you guys um, different workflows or different applications that you can use in combination with ZBrush um, so that you can get the most out of your model and or your renders. And so I, I might touch very briefly on a couple of different ways that I've been doing some rendering and modeling um, and texturing. Uh, so you know, probably discussion forward is that I'm just going to be using ZBrush uh, alongside with Blender and Box Cutter. Um, I'm also going to be using Octane and probably Marmoset, uh, and from here to there, I probably will use Cinema 4D um, just to make some repairs. And or, you know, Cinema 4D is one of those tools that it's a great um, uh, application for doing visual effects, uh, motion, anything that's uh, motion oriented, um, rendering as well. I'll be using Octane sometimes within uh, Cinema 4D. But that's sort of the roadmap uh, future forward for a lot of projects that I like to do. Um, so I'm just going to share them with you and sort of talk about some of the techniques that I used coming out of ZBrush, uh, integrating with other software so that I can uh, produce some of the models that I've been producing. So uh, I'm going to flip over, and you guys saw this on the title image. I have uh, two characters. One, uh, both of them are from comic projects uh, of mine that I've been probably drawing on and off for like two years now, but uh, I have a project called The War Taurus, which is a, a personal IP of mine that I've been building, and these two are characters from that universe, um, you know, just so that it's kind of weird, but, uh, you know, like at one point in time, they sort of cross paths, uh, but they're sort of like, uh, you know, here, spaghetti western type heroes uh, uh, that I'll probably explain later, but this guy is Goro and this guy is Spartan Oyabun and uh, they're both you know futuristic cyborgs with cyber bodies you know sort of in the cyberpunk vein but they're they're basically gladiators so you know sort of fitting that character style you know I've made them sort of you know of a, of a sort of physique male you know big large male physique uh, but uh, on the technical half of creating these uh, they were sculpted up in ZBrush entirely uh, and I've been playing around, uh, and I want to give a big shout out um, to uh, Mike Pavlovich uh, and his streams uh, for really turning me on to Insta LOD. Uh, and I, I was fortunate enough to write them, and they gave me uh, an evaluation seat license so that I could try out the software for myself. Uh, after Mike, you know, did his presentation of it, I was really inspired to try it out, especially because it looked fairly accessible coming out of ZBrush uh, into another application uh, such as like uh, Maya. So uh, I'm going to be actually using from time to time, here I'll flip over to Maya, uh, exporting out FBXs uh, with smoothed mesh over to Maya. And when I do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to probably try to crunch down and remesh a lot of the meshes that I have. Uh, and then what I'll do is uh, I actually have to probably reload uh, my plugin for this. but uh, once set up, uh, I'm able to take InstaLOD and crunch down and bake uh, my models out that uh, you know are high poly sculpts from ZBrush. Uh, taking those uh, then from Maya uh, as an FBX again and bringing them over to something like Mixamo. So I'm going to flip over and just show you sort of an interstitial view uh, of Mixamo. If you've never heard of it, Adobe has a service called Mixamo. Uh, in which they have a lot of uh, mocap data uh, that they've posted up in a collection 
uh, and I've been using these uh, to sort of give some of my character designs um, a little bit of movement. You know, like um, it's always great to model something, but really to see it move and sort of uh, have even just like some human-like gestures, you know, uh, it, it, it lends itself a lot to the design, you know, and, and reading the character of what you're producing. Now I know this looks probably kind of gnarly because, you know, this is a triangulated mesh uh, that's been smoothed. Uh, and you know there's a lot of detail here that probably the normals for a lot of the tries look a little bit weird but in the end it, it should be just fine so what I do is I upload uh, these characters here uh, either as an OBJ or FBX uh, keep in mind that when you use Mixamo a lot um, you're gonna have to take and produce characters that are fairly within a human silhouette right because it runs an algorithm it puts an automatic rig throughout the body of the character, uh, hands, arms, connected to a spine, head, neck, onto legs, and these groups come all the way down, right? Uh, and usually, I've had a lot of success with FBXs with smooth meshes or smoothing groups uh, already included. You can do that out of ZBrush, and I'm going to actually show you how. Uh, but once uploaded, you can take these characters uh, and put some motion to them, you know, just like even, say, if you had a a running pose, like this one is running with sword, I could do this, and there's no sword props or anything, you know, you have to make your own props, but if you grab the mocap data that has a position, I'm going to actually show you a little bit of how you can attach an object and parent it to your animation. All of the animation keyframes are actually pre-baked in to a lot of these mocap datas. So they might be in some ways hard to edit, but I think for those who know how to you know, do some advanced rigging in motion, uh, you could probably rewrite or you know, adjust a lot of the rig data um, to fit your needs and then just rebake the animation back in uh, to the character right once you've you've altered it but a lot of times what I do is I'll just grab a basic pose and then I'll download it and when I download uh, I have a setting just like this uh, as an FBX 30 frames per second and I'm gonna kind of come back to a few things um, I'm gonna show you this but I also wanted to go back to something that was similar to the theme of what we were building because uh, I actually built a couple of models I've actually been really busy uh, here in the last probably I guess it was a month month and a couple of weeks uh, building some some personal assets uh, and trying out a few things to um, offer some evaluation um, but you know and also establishing a workflow but anyway uh, back to the F uh, FBX uh, so once you want to get this downloaded what you do is just hit download download settings FBX right uh, if you're going to unity I suppose you could do that uh, Collada data, I'm not exactly sure what that is, but uh, I've never had to use it. So, but just basically an FBX, and this FBX will have, uh, all, again, all of the keyframes baked in. Uh, then, 30 frames per second, and depending on your needs, you know, you could probably go 24, or even if you want higher, smoother motion, you could probably grab uh, 60 frames per second, which might be a little bit more fluid than, say, 30 or 24. Uh, and then keyframe key reduction, we're going to put none. And I'll go ahead and download it. And I'll show you what you can do with that later. So just to, for an example, I'll download that one. But I also have another already set up. And going back to what I was saying about um, having a sword uh, or either a prop, like maybe you might have a shield or something of a like a, a firearm or something that you want to attach to your character uh, and by the way you know just speaking of workflows this works you know you can view these types of animation inside of uh, Marmoset uh, toolbag um, which is a great render uh, especially I mean it's very easy to get very straightforward um, and I'm going to flip over to you uh, or flip over and show you rather um, how some of that works out so just keep in mind if you have a uh, you know, if you subscribe to Adobe services like anything like uh, CC, you could probably, uh, within your uh, CC account, you know, sign up for Mixamo um, and then try this out with some of your own models. It's really great. If you have like a character model that you want to get walking or uh, even, you know, just some, some type of like idle gesture or something, um, you can use a lot of these animations and 
it's it's actually I it's it's actually a lot more customizable than I would have thought. Um, just because you know you think uh, most of these things would be templatized, and uh, you know it, it would be hard for you to customize anything you know with, uh, to really bring out the most of the character, but not true actually. Um, I've been able to put a wide range of meshes in here and sometimes some of the results um, one of the things that I might forewarn you about if you're interested in using Mixmo uh, for those who are either novice to more advanced users um, I would of course use maybe some weight painting into your model uh, sort of beforehand and that way you know you can kind of see uh, where things are not stretching right like maybe perhaps under the rib cage under the arms if the mesh is moving on a rig, it may stretch out some of the things or maps along uh, the rib cage or the side of the character or in the neck, something like that. There's always maybe just a few problems or a few areas where you might want to go in and do weight paints uh, so that you don't you don't ridiculously deform something. But in a lot of times, a lot of these presets, uh, you know, if something is modeled within a, a good uh, silhouette, um, the places where they'll bend, you can kind of work around them or hide them. Uh, you know, depending on you know what kind of you know shot that you want uh, to pick, but a good solid or even quad model uh, with UVs works for something like this. I went and actually used Insta LOD. I, I highly suggest looking up uh, Mike Pavlovich's uh, pistol. He made sort of like a, a futuristic pistol uh, demo where he was talking about Insta Insta LOD and its settings uh, in detail. I would seriously refer you to that uh, to watch it's uh, should be in his playlist but once uh, you try it and bring it over it can bake out all of the procedural maps that you would need to start uh, texturing and automatically place some UVs along the model and since this is uh, highly uh, triangulated um, it's smoothed out because of course I saved an FBX with uh, uh, smoothing groups or smooth normals um, applied to it. So I'm going to show you what that looks like. So I'm going to put this away and just kind of skip over just for a second. Um, this is actually rather post ZBrush, but I'm just going to go into Cinema 4D and kind of quickly show you how this is set up. So I brought in straightforward um, by default settings uh, my FBX animation and I know uh, probably this is a little bit outside of the mandate for ZBrush, but you know, in all process of a workflow, I thought I would present this to you guys. So what you're looking at is basically, if I go over here into the object editor and I open this up, uh, I have the actual rig data, which is this green icon here, Nixmo rig. And if, although it's labeled hips, if you expand this, and I'm gonna hit control and hit plus, it will expand all of the corresponding rigs with their titles, right? So simply what I've done is, I have an animation here. I'll just uh, play it, and of course, all of that animation was baked in when I saved it from Mixmo, and I brought it in. It doesn't have maps yet, and I haven't placed any, and I, I am actually gonna do that work inside of, um, inside of Marmoset, and I'll kind of show you how it's set up. So what I'll do is I'll take the rig and put it in with the skin, in, and by importing it. So usually file, merge objects, and then you know open up your either OBJ or FBX uh, by importing it this way. Um, and then once in, uh, what you would have is basically a skeleton that would have some movement applied to it, but the prop that I've brought in would not be attached. So basically what I've had to do is import both models. Here, I'll close uh, just this part here. What I'll do is, uh, this null is basically a group, uh, so basically you'll have to import your mesh uh, and the animation, which was all in one, and then I had to import, I don't know if you caught it, but way down here in the titles for all of these rigs, there is the right arm, hand, and then the sword. And so what I did was I had to move the sword down in, in this group uh, just in the hierarchy past the right hand and put it in its rig hierarchy. So basically the model is now constrained to the rig that is going through the hand, right? So that way when I play it, I'll hit play here, you get a nice smooth movement of the sword which was just sitting still in space, 3D space, 
uh, connected to the rig. So as he does his little breathing and sway move in the animation, the sword is now moving with him. Uh, and then simply just go to file. You know, once you've grouped, uh, once you've grouped this out, uh, this null represents a group that has, you know, the mesh and the rig. That's the rig first, and then the mesh uh, all together. And of course, in that rig's hierarchy is the OBJ for the sword, right? So I could uh, potentially do this if I had one that has like a gun pose that's idle. I could make the gun move along with the body in sort of the same fashion. Because previously, I think I've showed you guys some stuff where. I had not yet used constraints uh, to the rig to attach an object uh, to that to that character. So basically, after that's done, you just select your group, of course, and of course, you know, hit export uh, and then FBX and go through the prompts. Um, it, there's also a dialog box in which you can choose some of your export settings. Uh, just for example, sake, I'm gonna save this one. save it and it would look something like this so I could do selection only but I'm actually just gonna leave it so I've left it unchecked FBX version is 7.5 for 2016 I think because I'm using uh, R19 it's a little bit older but uh, R20 should probably look exactly about the same uh, and I'm just including textures and materials embedded textures uh, or and or substances, you know, like if you have a, a substance file from substance designer or painter uh, selected, you know, or ready to go. This has already been baked from uh, Insta LOD, so it has uh, UVs on its uh, model. Um, but the the UVs are never really for something that comes out of Insta Insta LOD. They they're not seriously pretty UVs. So um, if you had expectations that it would be, you know totally unfolded like a, a regular game quadded model uh, it might be a little bit different and sometimes even a little bit confusing but I'm going to show you how to work out um, color IDs so when you do something like this you'll be able to easily select um, all of the you know designated parts that you want to apply different textures so this is where you know the discussion starts to turn more towards um, any of the mapping software that I would use of course you know you could probably you know, do a lot of different bakes um, coming out of ZBrush, but Insta LOD, the way that it approaches it is the whole mesh would probably be, you know, like let's say this is all Dynamesh, right? Uh, there's no way that you could put UVs on something Dynamesh and have it, you know, sort of operate like a normal model. Uh, you would actually have to crunch some of those poly, uh, polys down from the high poly. Uh, Insta LOD will do that and then bake, you know, its high poly information onto the low poly uh, UV it and just give you a set of uh, uh, meshes plus the MTL and the actual textures that would be associated with its you know procedural bake uh, which would be basically you know you get uh, ambient occlusion uh, just basically almost here I'm gonna cancel this actually I'll go back and I'll look at my directory just to show you guys what it looks like uh, hold on here derp. let me get uh, drive open to show you. I'm going to go into I and let's see, where's our guy? Didn't want to find. Sorry, just for one on second. I'm going to open this up and show you the directory I have going for this. So basically all of these maps came out of Insta LOD when I did a bake. So ambient occlusion, uh, color ID maps for each individual piece. This actually has some ZBrush work behind it and I should probably show you how to do it. It's the most simplest thing ever, but it took me a minute to figure it out. Uh, but, you know, I wanna there again, give a shout out to uh, Joseph Drust and thanks for his Ask ZBrush series in which I found the most quickest answer. So remember, sometimes when you're in a jam and you need to Google something on ZBrush, Ask ZBrush, hashtag Ask ZBrush is the perfect way to go to find out um, you know, maybe some, some hidden an <laughs> answers to questions that, you know, uh, you just didn't get right away. Anyway, um, so I, I got a curvature map, a displacement map, a normal map, a normal object or object space normal map, uh, a position gradient, and a thickness map. So if you're going to Substance Painter or something like that, of course, you can use the same maps plus the OBJ uh, or associated OBJs that you know for your model and these maps bring them in and start texturing 
I um, still have uh, my older version of uh, Quixel Suite 2. I think those guys are going to be soon going to um, more uh, a mixer and um, Mega Scans roadmap, and so uh, it's probably not. I don't. I think you can still pick it up, but I, I guess it's just not super su uh, supported uh, by Quixel anymore. But I'll show you a few things from there if I can, because uh, I wanted to squeeze in a lot into today's two hours. So moving right along, I got those maps ready and I have my animation with my prop attached to the rig, uh, save that out as an FBX, and that's where I tend to, after texturing, go over to, uh, squeeze over to uh, Marmoset here, uh, and I'm going to show you a layout that I've done for Spartan Oyabun, right? So this character is a, a sort of full bodied, full prosthesis cyborg character, you know, it's probably got sort of a, a fashionable style of, you know, not wearing so much, uh, uh, he's not so much into jackets, coats, or, or tops, so I, I left his upper body sort of bare without clothes, and I sculpted up some, some pants and a, I guess, um, so, sort of like an obi, like a Japanese style obi wrap, uh, something you would find on a male uh, yukata or summertime type of uh, uh, Japanese men's casual kimono. Um, just to give him a little bit of a, a flair to his outfit, you know, and he's got sort of baggy, uh, you know, cargo pants and split toe, you know, tabi boots, uh, sort of like a Japanese construction worker would wear, but sort of in its look, uh, sort of modernized as perhaps look something like, a, you know, some something you'd buy in the future, you know, or, uh, maybe some space colonists would kind of market something like that. You need some. Uh, some good, some good boots out in space, you know, in the colonies. So anyway, uh, this is a, some might recognize this, but this is just a piece of geometry that is a neon sign that I made a while back ago. I made a nice bullet to sort of frame this, this scene in. But let's skip over to the animation because it looks nice in render, and of course, you know, all of these textures are PBR textures. Um, I am using the Unreal 4 template for these. Uh, so just when you know when you set these up, first thing when I bring a model in uh, is that I would bring in uh, the model with uh, no no materials attached to it, right? It would just be raw naked. So just for example sake, like uh, here I'll drop one in. Uh, I'm gonna hit Control I on the keyboard, and basically that will be my um, importer. And where I've gone is, I'm still at my FBX animation folder. So after Mixamo, basically I just grabbed like a bunch of different mocap data, right? Uh, that I've set, some that I've customized, and I bring all of these uh, over to Marmoset, right? Uh, you can bring them in other places like Maya, you know, maybe if you're doing a scene in Maya, or if you're um, animating a scene in Blender, or, you know, Max, or what have you. Uh, you can use your 3D renderer and bring models over to uh, the environment in Marmoset and just so that you can preview them. So what I have to do is basically take something like dropping this, I haven't used this one yet, and I'll open it. And once it's in, it might have a default material on it. All right? Sorry, it's got a cache for a second. Give me one second. Usually when you touch a uh, Marmoset uh, straight off to go, um, if you have a lot of models included, it takes a second for it to cache it, I guess, into the file. But it would look like this. I'll put this version of Oyabun down the line here, sort of close to what would be an imagined floor. Turn it around, make sure everybody's sort of on the same plane. There we go. And this guy's got no materials. In fact, if I just drop a default material on it, uh, it's probably kind of bright, but basically you can see that this guy has no detail it's basically just the mesh uh, that same triangulated mesh and this came out of insta LOD or insta LOD if you will um, but it's smoothed out and it just looks like a sort of a naked maybe game style um, type of uh, model uh, resolution wise uh, I'm using 4k maps uh, for this that I've generated out of Quixel Suite 2 uh, and but all of this was just high poly sculpt from um, ZBrush and actually some of the, the topology was really a mixed bag like the chest was Dynamesh the arms were Dynamesh 
the hands, the fingers. The fingers were separate objects that were DynaMesh. Sometimes every once in a while I might remesh things using ZRemesher, but uh, basically what it does is it takes all of those meshes uh, and then I've exported them out as an FBX, right? Uh, or OBJ sometimes, in, in which case it, it will work. Um, even with DynaMesh, it's just kind of crazy, you know, like, uh, like no way would I be able to use this, you know, viably anywhere else. But Instalod actually crushed it down, uh, did a serious reduction, I think from about 1.2 million down to about the 70,000 range. Uh, just enough for me to drop it into, you know, maybe an engine if I wanted to, or let's say if I wanted to go beyond uh, Marmoset, I could easily probably try to put these guys into Unreal. But for a lot of lighting and comping, I love to bring things into Marmoset and really work some of the lighting, you know, through HDR lights. And of course, you know, here, on the left when you see like the sky I have an HDRI that I've custom put in here and I basically wanted to reach all of the hot spots of light so I've made basically what is kind of like um, if you know if for those who use Keyshot a lot these are almost like pin adding pins in uh, the HDRI editor um, and basically you know from that skybox I'll take things and you know just give like the backdrop a color like black I've added some fog uh, Go down a little bit, uh, collapse some of these. Uh, let's see here, fog two. So I have two different fogs that I've played with. You can always add certain materials by going up here to material, uh, or actually scene, add object. Sorry, uh, and then from add object you can put lights, cameras, fog, sky. You know, just on down the line. Uh, so you know, working those, I actually come through and I just set up my scene so that it gets like a proper type of studio light that I want. Um, I've also gone into uh, the main camera, and I believe down on the focus, you can set up a uh, depth of field. I haven't actually set that up in this file yet. Um, and then flare or bloom settings. A lot of the post-process settings are over here on the left when you click on the main camera. Uh, render and scene, you know, probably go through some of these. You know, you can choose like a high DPI. Uh, probably if you need to view wireframe you can turn it on and give it a color uh, show scale reference is basically you know just like seeing um, you know the scale from a regular six-foot human uh, person I think I scaled these a little large because I wanted the maps to not I, I wanted the maps to have the most resolution when I baked them out and stuff like that so I think I scaled this guy actually three times or four times the size um, and then you know baked them out and all that good stuff but once in Quixel, you know, I can use different materials. Um, in fact, this is sort of a mix of smart materials that are already built in. Um, the same thing would be, you know, in Painter, when you bring uh, a model in and you do a bake initially, or you pl start plugging in its procedural maps from Go, uh, then you can start, you know, choosing different setups um, for materials and just drop those in, and all of these correspond with uh, color IDs. So basically. I'm going to show you this. If I come over here and I click on this third icon, which is load various material presets, right? Uh, the very one on the last bottom here, uh, Unreal 4 template is what I've chosen. And if I take this and I put this on top of the model, it's going to probably look something like this, right? Uh, and then while this is selected, what I do is I start plugging in uh, a lot of the maps that I've created. So in other words, normal. If I need to go back directory, I'll get uh, the normal map, and this is actually these are actually the maps before I actually textured this thing up. But I just want to get you sort of an idea of what it looks like when you initially bring it in and start uh, doing your look development for this. Uh, and the reason for doing things in this way, uh, and why uh, why am I using these rendering apps, is because I can make stills of these very easily, and then do a capture uh, like either an image or you know uh, bake it out there, there are bakers within marmoset but mostly what I want to do is get an image or a key lit image so that I can later do um, a Photoshop output or export uh, where all of these are masked out like maybe the environment is masked out and I can take this on a transparent layer and I can start painting and basically photo bashing or you know, building other 3D assets for backgrounds, or even drawing in and painting uh, live things uh, to the perspective, to the character's lighting. 
and I can do concept art that way and or if I just want to make illustrations or key illustrations or cinematics uh, type style illustrations uh, I can use 3d assets and a lot of times um, with a few other renders like say um, Keyshot and I believe also with Octane, like if you use Octane uh, standalone, you can put some nice tune shaders on these and they're very clean objects to try to uh, turn into an actual illustration. Uh, but I'll get to that a little bit later. So with this material, I've just got the material set up, which is a, an Unreal template material, and it's normal plugged in so far. I'm going to skip uh, roughness for now and I'm going to come down to Albedo Map and I'm just going to grab my color IDs and plug it in and so when you see this you'll see all of the areas that are basically becoming masks uh, so that you can easily select objects and start placing different materials on if you'd like you might get a few reflections in here that's what this is but basically if I was to turn the roughness up a bit so this is a bit flatter and not so metallic I'll turn the metallic down about halfway so we get a nice matte finish on this and I'll just hide over here to the left and in the outliner I'll just hide the fog uh, so that that way we get the straight light and it's not distorted too much from the fog uh, sometimes some atmospherics happen when you when you have different or various lights from different directions um, it sort of flushes out the light a little bit so I, I usually keep my fog settings kind of low as of late uh, for exactly that same reason so you know if you look at this model you might have like just a tiny bit of stretching that again that's where you know some of those areas where you know maybe you have intersections or stretching um, they can be worked out but this is also you know using Mixamo and if you take the static poses from a lot of those uh, sometimes they became great poses for you to pose up your model in ZBrush and then re-export so just very quickly like if you ever wanted to pose up a model with Mixamo stop the animation like let's say if I want it somewhere just a little bit more interesting you can play it pause it and maybe take this pose choose the mesh and then go from file export model file and when you do that you can put the materials or embed the materials export it and it'll give you the choice of either using an FBX or OBJ or DAE Collada model right I think Collada has to be some type of other data that you know is an export style data that you can bring in to, you know apps sort of universally I have never used it but so I can't speak to it but uh, I am sure it's useful somewhere but anyway you know then you would just save out your model and then from there you know you could uh, take it back into ZBrush and sort of repose you know some things uh, maybe use some transpose or you know world space gizmos to kind of work out some areas that might be bent or stretched uh, but it's a great way to get sort of like a paused motion still Right? And so I've got different masks, uh, material masks through my color IDs. One for the boots, pants, the pockets, the buckle on the side of the pockets, if you can see it there. There it is. Might be a little bit hard. There we go. And I'm just using shift and the right mouse button to sort of rotate my HDRI lighting until I get something kind of interesting. Right? Uh, and so, you know, separate for the fingers, chest, and arms, uh, the bolts on the clavicle there, his back has maybe a few bolts, tiny ones down there, and then all of the little modular plates that are on the head of Spartan Oyaba. So his eye plates, and then in his eyes there's a little tiny ID there for um, the emissive later when I turn it on. And after I start plugging the maps, so basically I'm leaving out roughness and metalness, which are two maps out of the PBR, or physically based render maps. Um, PBR only requires basically about four maps, but you generally I bake out a few more um, just for the added value. So like say for example if I go to occlusion, I'm going to push this uh, button here, this little minus button, and choose the occlusion from the menu, and I can plug in the ambient occlusion map. And so once I have that, you might notice that maybe just around some of the edges uh, there might be a little bit more uh, detail you know as far as the shadows go uh, within certain areas but um, you know just bump up the occlusion maybe turn it on also under the main camera I believe there's 
actually no, not camera, sorry, render. Uh, there is an uh, ambient occlusion check mark and slider here for occlusion strength. So actually you could bump these up just even more and get a little bit more sharper depth out of a lot of the shadows that cover the surface of the character's body or whatnot, right? So this is kind of like looking at the stage before I textured and the stage after I textured. And to speak of our animation, let's actually take this guy, the new guy, we'll hide him for the moment, and I will click on this guy, and I'll hit Control, uh, sorry, Control F to actually frame it. Sorry, I had to remember what the shortcut was there for a second. Uh, but anyway, I have safe frame turned on, uh, which is something within the camera settings that you can turn on. Uh, and this basically just gives me a, probably a 16 over 9 ratio um, going across the screen. So if I hit Control Enter, I'm actually going to you know full screen the interface and then hit Spacebar on Marmoset and go full screen. And I'll play it and hide. Now I have a couple of apps running, so both of my cards might be running a little hard right now. but. This is basically the motion. I'm not probably getting 100%. I think I have another Marmoset project open, and it's probably giving my GPUs some work uh, trying to animate or play these. But uh, so I wouldn't take it as this is the actual frame rate. Plus, going through you know Twitch or whatever, it might be a little just choppy. But usually, it's pretty smooth playing when I'm not streaming online. <laughs> But uh, either way, you know, if you have a POV or something, you can screen capture this kind of thing or basically take a lot of your frames, like your render frames, um, and bake out something like a 60 frames per second uh, animation and then take that image sequence into After Effects uh, or Cinema, or not, uh, After Effects, sorry, um, and also Premiere. Um, you can probably take the footage over to there and compile it together and then add audio and all kinds of great effects. But before that, just to give, you know, like say if you had a client who wanted to see your uh, character models move and, you know, you wanted to sort of give like a, a character look dev kind of sheet, these kinds of things are great because um, it's like moving concept art, right? It doesn't take much to sculpt it up in a few hours, spend the time, you know, detailing. You don't really have, I mean, as long as everything with it is within silhouette to the human form like I was speaking of earlier, uh, you should be able to drop these into Mixamo, get some mocap data, place it on the model, and get it moving. So I think I covered some of this um, uh, maybe a few streams ago, but I wanted to sort of recap this because I'm going to be doing a lot of uh, workflow stuff, you know, oriented around some of these steps, you know, like actually adding motion to a lot of the models that I build and share with you guys. Right? And so again, you know, you can just see the mesh preview through by clicking on it. Uh, here again, of course, this center guy here holding the sword uh, is uh, the model that we just adjusted in Cinema 4D. And as you can see in his sway, the, the loop that's happening for his sway pattern is actually the sword is moving with the hands, not just the body moving and the sword not, you know, aligned correctly. Right? The eyes, as I tilt up, have that small dot of emission coming through. It gives them sort of a nice, you know, dark hero sort of uh, menacing look, that, that sort of thing. And of course, you know, things get a lot more dramatic the more that you light or take away from the light. So if I rotate this, I get some nice cast light from the side of the face, you know, and uh, the swagger walk is what's up. <laughs> okay, so. You know, and of course, different materials. Um, if you look closely into this um, into this model, actually, let me pause this just for a second so you can see the details without it moving around. Uh, this is a custom uh, map that I or textured material that I made inside of Quixel. I think I used some templates and gave it a little bit of dust and dirt via some curvature uh, masking, uh, or in the system, I believe it's called uh, Dyna masking inside of Quixel, um, and using that shaded uh, curvature map basically to go within my color IDs and just apply the texture uh, and then maybe add a couple of different masks to it so that I can put dust, dirt, cavity dirt, that sort of thing. Uh, and I added a few different maps so that I can have more bump to a lot of the maps. Even though I'm using four PBR maps essentially, uh, I have to probably apply and generate a, type of, a couple of different other maps 
so that I get the entire look down, right? So in other words, the bump may affect some of the normal data, and then, you know, here you won't see, uh, you know, mu any shadows really, like the AO wouldn't bake out if there wasn't a little bit of bump and normal working together to sort of bring some of these details in the materials off of the surface, right? So that's how you get, you know, like a grainy uh, polymer look here. Um, some of these maps, you know, they have might maybe a little bit of mipping, but you know, from a farther view back, uh, you're not going to see it. Or you know, sometimes edgeware can get a little crazy. Uh, so I kind of try to dial it down to just sort of like a more flat material that's a little bit general for something like this, right? So if you just wanted to use it, you know, like if you're a game person and you're doing, you know, stuff in uh, Unreal or Unity, this is a great sort of process to use to sort of present some of your models and sort of get like a, a, a general look. Uh, but to use them in full games, uh, you can also use a lot of the mocap data from Mixamo in uh, either Unity or Unreal. And I believe um, even you can combine some animations. Uh, same way with C4D, you can combine animations together to get like a series of movement, movements together so they kind of are, are flexible poses uh, I think animation blending for Unreal um, will have you bring in each different animation uh, along with the same maps um, a few different types uh, times on a character and then you apply that with its blueprints uh, loading up one animation over the other so that they blend that sort of thing uh, I know there's some information like that out on YouTube um, I, I haven't put anything together for it yet because I'm still sort of uh, doing the investigating and getting into Unreal myself. But, you know, if you push play, of course, you can see your movement. You can slow these down uh, speed-wise, like say if it's going too fast. Um, but I'm going to stay within the frame rate. I'm not going to chop anything down. So uh, I'm just going to slow it down by just a little bit. So maybe 688, 0.688. And I get a little slower view so that you can see everything, the movements, the textures, that sort of thing. And I adjust my light again, get something kind of nice and dramatic, maybe sort of foreshadowed like this. So maybe our light is above and it's hitting hard on the shoulders and head, and maybe a little bit on the side of the face, right? So it's a lot of fun stuff. Okay. So again, do let me know if you guys have any questions. Um, I'm, I'm sort of keeping an eye, an eye on the chat. Um, I'm just seriously wondering if you guys can hear me okay and if everything's going okay. So give me a shout out and let me know if you guys are getting all of this or have any questions. Um, please, because sometimes I'll just get going and I won't stop and you know, you might be like, well, what did he say? So anyway, okay. So that's Marmoset. So I'm going to pause that. And I'll put this away. So I wanted to go back to this guy. So how do we get a lot of these characters out of ZBrush? So one of the things is I work from a merged copy. So you may have something like this where it's merged and then later I split it apart. Uh, but I basically only had it merged because I wanted to use um, Colorize to basically put color IDs on everything. So just as a note, um, when you have your model and it's say done, it's put together. Most of this was done in box cutter, you know, as far as the block out. And then I did a lot of uh, bashing, some with my own bash pieces and a few others from friends. Uh, put you know stuff on the model and sort of completed the look. And then once I had that, I just merged it. So of course, if you're familiar, you can come down to the merge. I just do a merge visible and I think I might have checked UVs merged in subtool when I did that so <coughs> it really doesn't matter for the UVs because <coughs> excuse me at this point what we're looking at is building a solid mesh you know whether it be dynamesh high res or even you know um, non sub uh, geometry in a lot of ways a lot of these parts were made in box cutter uh, in Blender 2.8. So they're, when I export them, they're gonna be triangulated meshes. Maybe some a little less efficient than others, um, but you can always bring them into ZBrush and of course use uh, your geometry tab, going down to ZRemesher and trying to work some of the numbers, uh, keeping groups and, and detect edges on for ZRemesher 3 and sort of optimizing some of these pieces piece by piece. 
But there's a lot of objects in here, um, I realized, and so I wouldn't want to go and have to Z-Remesh every single little piece throughout maybe 30 subtools or more, right? So the best thing to do is just merge it, and then when I have it merged, basically the way that I get my IDs is uh, I come down here to the bottom and we want to get polypaint open. Polypaint. So if you can't see it on my screen, I'm going to use the loop tool. Oops, sorry, shift M. There we go. So polypaint right under morph target. And I'm going to actually turn on colorize and then polypaint from polygroups. So basically, polypaint from polygroups for every polygroup that you have. Shift M to get rid of that loop again. I'll hit Shift F to bring up my polyframes. Uh, and let me look at actually a merged duplicate of this. So this actually has no poly paint in it. It's just solid white, right? Uh, probably skin shade white or skin shade four uh, white material, nothing on it. But everything in the model has been finished and it was merged at this point. But if you look, Shift F, at my polygroups, Every single different object probably has a group on it. Some of them you might want to group a little bit more together, um, but you can choose a lot of these and mask off a lot of these simply hitting W and hitting Control and clicking on that polygroup, which will mask out a color. So like if, let's say, if you wanted to add a division to your color IDs, you could simply go here, hit Control, oop, sorry. Uh, there we go hit control W and that would turn that group into a different polygroup color right right now it's divided already but it's fine I just wanted to show you how to individually select something or like let's say even you know you have different groups like this that you want to get them all in the same group um, you could probably use you know the hide and select method of just grabbing like you know this and pulling it out oops sorry that actually masked it Q there we go click it again that gets rid of that and then you know turn off dynamic and grab just these guys here uh, actually sorry I'm gonna do this grab the lasso come in here Oops. there we go grab the lasso and just select these guys and then you could hit control W unhide everything and you've got your singular group for there right and the same way so since everything already has most of its groups together, and we have a lot of different groups, some of them you might want to trim down. So like if you didn't necessarily need every single little thing to be a different group, you know, you can sort of go and hide and select and sort of merge uh, some of your um, uh, polygroups together by using that command W, um, you know, with what is visible uh, and make it a different polygroup. And then, coming down to polypaint and let's see if I hit shift F go back to the you know base white there <coughs> I'm just gonna come over to polypaint hit colorize gradient colors no and polypaint from polygroups and every beca thing becomes a solid right if you had a polygroup that was different on one side. Of, I, of course, I recommend probably doing a geometry, uh, going to the geometry tab, and doing a mirror and weld in the modified geometry area, right here. So you can mirror and weld. Keep in mind that that works along the X or something like that by default, I believe. Uh, and then mirror one side over to the other, which should probably make both sides have equal. You know, um, if, I mean, if basically if they're symmetrical. You could kick over the polygroups from whatever you made on one side over to the other so that they're equalized. But once I have that, uh, I could take this mesh and basically save it and bring it to Instant LOD. Um, for the matter of having this stuff on screen, I was going to show you guys some stuff with setting this up, but it takes a minute to bake these things out. Um, Instant LOD works great, but sometimes if it, if it has a difficult mesh in front of it, uh, it could take a minute, and I don't want to spare the time while we are in the stream, but I'll show you the finished result again. Uh, let me first just bounce over to uh, Blender, and I'll show you exactly where this was. So, oops, let's do this. Always got to remember different hotkeys, different mouth 
mouse navigation when I switch apps like this. But anyway, um, so slowly but surely, I sort of built up a system of booleans uh, using modifiers um, in box cutter on geometry in Blender. <clears throat> and then I blocked out and put all of these pieces together. So basically just thinking of the arm structure, um, joints I would worry about in ZBrush, a lot of the rest of the joints for the hips I would worry about in ZBrush. I made these objects here sort of close enough to interlock with each other. And if I had made a cylinder here, I think I made a cylinder inside of ZBrush and put it inside of there. So, excuse me one second, let me just make sure the guys have something playing in the background that I didn't want. There we go. Uh, sorry about that. Give me one sec. So anyway, back to this. This is exactly how the block out looked, and I just wanted to show you guys because this is exactly how far I went uh, inside of the environment on Blender and basically grabbed all of this. Uh, so let's say I hit B, get that selection, and once, you know, you don't even have to click and drag over the environment. If you have the model solidly there and everything else is hidden, you could just hit deselect actually by hitting a, double A, oops, oh, I'm getting stuck, I must have actually pushed, I think I pushed something wrong, and it's hanging, oh well, but yeah, uh, excuse me, oh, I accidentally put down a cutter, and it's probably chewing on it for a second, here I'll actually get rid of this for a second. That's the thing about Blender, it's so nice and light that uh, when I use it, like, you know, it usually autosaves fairly recently, and it's so light that I could run it off of a thumb drive if I had to, but uh, we'll close that just for a second because I think it got hung up on something, and I'll just reopen it. And once we're there... Come on, why are you not responding? I must have a lot of stuff open, I think. There we go. Open, there we go. All right. So, where I was was um, just setting this up, uh, and then, you know, I do block outs um, here in Blender, but when I hit all, and then file, export, FBX, a lot of times my, um, Setups are a little bit different between OBJ and FBX, but this is basically the interface at which I would save it, and go through some of these, and you know, make sure you know if it's selected objects or what have you. Um, if you use an OBJ export, you know, Wavefront OBJ, uh, some of the things here for settings that I I like to use, and I should probably tell you guys, um, makes makes a little things a little bit easier down the line. Uh, I use selection only. Um, if there's an animation, sometimes I can attach that, but in this case there is not yet. Uh, smooth groups. Uh, and then I come down and hit triangulate faces. Um, and most importantly, you want to make sure to have apply modifiers. So if you have any modifiers uh, for any of the geometry, um, it's not going to hold it unless you click on apply modifiers. So anything from the modifier stack that you've used with box cutter or anything like that, you want to make sure that those are applied when you save it out. Smoothing groups, uh, yes, very much important. Um, and then of also, um, if I have different materials inside of Blender um, that I want to get out and use those as material IDs for something, a lot of times what I'll do is I'll turn on the material groups, right? So with that, then I would just hit and export that out, right? Okay, so once that is done, and I go through Quixel, I just want to show you guys sort of how these things look. I'll show you this file. 
which is something just I kind of mocked up and threw together. But this is a couple of assets that I've put together. One is the floor is a box cut just tile that I've repeated, and then there's a different wall tile just to sort of close it off. Uh, these pillars are from uh, the original Blade Runner film, and I sculpted it up in ZBrush. And here again is a case in point where um, I had a sculpt in which it was a high resolution sculpt or a high poly sculpt using Dynamesh. I think some of these tubes I made with the uh, curved mesh tool and then Dynameshed it and then sculpted up um, a lot of detail like cracks, major cracks and landmarks on it. Uh, but all of these were Z-remeshed shapes and then some of these were just drawn objects with a radial tool like for the circle, squash those. Uh, for these little, you know, guys right here, some of the, it's very Aztec, uh, the design of these pillars. If you recall seeing Blood Runner, if it's a personal favorite of yours, like it is mine, um, you're familiar with this pillar. It's in front of the Bradbury building uh, in the scene with JF. And I thought it was such one of the, like, more iconic things that I kind of wanted to do a, an object to sort of head nod Blade Runner. Uh, for the, all those that worked this up. I think there's a gentleman's name, I can't remember, who was the original sculptor who sculpted these out of foam and then they were placed in front of the Bradbury building. So they're not actually on the architecture as it is on Broadway in downtown LA today. But with a few lights uh, moving around, I'm gonna hit shift and the middle mouse button and just sort of move this around. You know, you can set up your lights and get different things. But um, that's just speaking to the, the environment and the light. This guy, I actually textured up uh, in Quixel, and it was just very quickly to see if it would work, and when I was doing some early experiments with um, ZBrush, Blender, um, bringing things over to Instalod, maybe sometimes, you know, going into Moy and creating like a few interesting objects here and there, um, that sort of thing. And also, in ZBrush, I, I like to do a lot of kit flashing, so, you know, I create some interesting silhouettes. Um, in Blender and then I bring those over to ZBrush. I can Dynamesh them and then maybe put fine details in the surfaces, that sort of thing. Uh, and, but I also use IMMs and like to create IMMs uh, exactly for this so that I can kit bash uh, something together. Uh, but now that I can UV things in Instalot and sort of do some look development, I put some maps on this and just sort of do some uh, other visual development on some of these things. So when you look down, all of these things were the scratches of the metal are, or all of the curvature maps and maps working together, like I think this is a painted metal uh, that I, I created. Uh, just using sort of the color IDs and the maps and the curvature map, I can get edge wear and I can do solid, solid fills of objects. So maybe just for some of these mechanics I might do something a little bit more, um, you know, uh, dirty, uh, but just have enough metal to make it sort of look clean and, and convincing and lived in enough, right? Um, but, you know, fun stuff. So I'm just going to show you really quick how I take some of these models uh, and do textures with them. Um, so you've seen things in, in ZBrush, uh, finally, how they come out. And then I take those high res and I send them over to Maya and I crunch them down in Insta LOD. Uh, I do a lot of rendering and look dev inside of Marmoset. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to move over to Photoshop just really quick. And I'm going to show you guys kind of just, this is a still that I created from the same um, uh, splash banner for today's demo. And basically this is a shot that I captured out of Marmoset and brought it into Photoshop. And just, you know, giving you an idea of, you know, I could still take a lot of this, you know, paint in an environment, do some creative masking, uh, and get something that's kind of, you know, near photo real or, um, you know, just as a concept, I, I might want to put the characters in an environment. All of that can happen, but through photo editing inside of Photoshop. But more or less, I just wanted to put, show you guys this, and I wanted to put it away for a second. Uh, so I'll save it. Uh, yeah, that's fine. Save. Okay, so we're going to put that away, and I'm actually going to show you guys how this works. So with this version of Photoshop, I am using, uh, I believe I'm using, 2018, right? Which is a little bit older. Uh, I think if you're a customer of, uh, of Creative Cloud, you could probably even go back to it. Uh, but I think it, it finds that it, it find that it works well with Quixel Suite because it's an older plugin now, just a little by a little bit. I think there are a couple of uh, Photoshop versions have come out since then. 
so it, it's always had a, maybe a little bit more of a problem with 2019, but I think still within support range for 2018, right? So I'm just going to hit the start menu and hit Q and bring up my Quixel Suite. And it's a plugin that's going to open inside of Photoshop. It has an explicit connection to Photoshop. And I'm going to bring in and just quickly bake a model and show you kind of how I set things up. So I'm going to be using Dido really quickly. Uh, and this is post ZBrush Instalot with Maya bringing in the mesh plus the procedural bakes that I had outputted out of Maya, right? So all of those things, they use a pipeline, uh, uh, sort of a, a pipeline that's built into the plugin inside of Maya. So when you use Insta LED, you've got your crunch down mesh that it outputs, it UVs it and it bakes it at the same time, and then it produces all of the maps that I would need for baking here in Quixel. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna choose the mesh, and just as an example, I'm gonna use one of the other ones. Uh, let's see, I'll use Spartan's map, but let's grab the OBJ there, and I'll open it. You can use uh, OBJs and FBX for this as well. And I'll go to the material ID, and I'll grab the material ID, I'll grab the normal. Uh, depending on naming, a lot of times it can automatically uh, import your other maps, but in this case I'm just going to manually get each one so that everybody gets it, understands. Uh, and also just as a sub note, a lot of times I have heard uh, for Unreal you may have actually set this calibration to export target here uh, to UE4, which is Unreal Engine 4. Um, and the ID pres preset I'm going to leave as none for its default because I'm going to have all of my masks here in the material ID. Uh, but on the normal, uh, you may or may not want to flip Y, which is the yellow channel, I believe, um, for a bake for presenting. I think that it might be the other way around inside of uh, Unreal Engine um, for that channel. So you can flip the Y possibly for that. Uh, I'm not sure if Quixel actually does it automatically, but in this case, I'm just going to check it uh, and make sure. Uh, in the end, and inside of uh, Marmoset, it previewed just A-OK. -okay. I used the Unreal uh, material template, as you saw, and so I can just plug the maps right straight away. And then once plugged, every time I save or export, export excuse me, from uh, Quixel, it's actually going to update inside of Marmoset. So I'll kind of show you how to set that up. Um, going again back, I'm going to hit the AO, bring that in. I'm going to bring in the object space normal. Uh, you have the option of baking this inside of 3 but I'm just going to actually bypass that and just have the straight up map come in. That's this. Open. Curvature. It seems to already have it checked, but I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that it's loaded anyway. Uh, also something that could be baked inside of 3 but for this I'm not going to do that. Uh, position gradient uh, is this one down here. Position gradient is a hard map. I'm not exactly sure what it is, but it seems to take the sort of like a, a world space gradient and apply it to the model for whatever its position. I guess maybe some lighting and detail are in that information. Uh, height if you have it, I think. Within Quixel, you're probably not going to use the thickness. I don't see it listed here in the map, so I'm probably going to skip it for this one. But then now, what I'm going to do is, I've of course got uh, PBR settings for this, so I'm just going to be going 16-bit uh, per channel, um, and I, I probably, let's see, full is going to be whatever the uh, map size. So these maps, when I generated them, I made them 4096, so that's 4K, so they should hold detail pretty well. I'm going to go ahead and just hit Create. And this is going to take a second, this is where I drink some coffee. Mm. Excuse me. All right, we're making good time. Sometimes this takes a few minutes to set up, but bear with me. In the meantime, uh, if anyone watching on Twitch has any questions, please let me know. And the same for Facebook. I actually need to. <laughs> find Let's 
sorry, folks, bear with me just for a second here. It's probably gonna take a second to bake all of this out. Not by long, though. But better that I show you guys in real time how this looks and what to expect. I had an additional video of content uh, that I made for you guys I wanted to show. Uh, maybe after this bake, I'll show you a few outputs of uh, how some of this stuff comes out. But just one moment. Okay, so now you're able to get started. So I'm gonna hit OK, and I'm gonna place this interface over here. Basically, basically these are sort of a, a layer uh, dialog box for all of your maps. Uh, basically what you have here is albedo, or the color map that gets generated, a metalness map, a normal map, and a roughness map. And because I don't have uh, metalness and roughness yet just ready with any detail, it just may look like flat gray or black, because uh, I believe it operates within sort of like a grayscale. Um, and there, they would be gray values in here to give your materials sort of like the equalized look of uh, metallic and rubber. And, you know, all of your material breakups will be, you know, sort of parsed out in grayscale for their different numerical values and specularity and diffuse values, right? So. I just keep this checked on albedo and I'm going to open up 3 uh, which is the previewer inside of Quixel Suite 2 and of course you know a lot of this works differently than Megascans and or Mixer um, I think if you were mapping something procedurally where you're using just the UVs with one particular map uh, you could probably make a singular material with Mixer I think they're still working on uh, trying to get custom meshes in there so that you can apply different materials to you know, one single object but uh, talk about things that are forthcoming so okay so my here's my bake and this is basically the basis of uh, you know that bake and you know all the AOs everything combined together um, to give me my maps and because my mesh is smoothed um, you know it, it there's not too much faceting on a lot of the edges. They become a little bit smoother. Um, you can see some of the AO and cavity turned on. But basically, I want to go ahead now. Uh, also, in 3D, if I hit the C, do, C key, sorry, you will start to see a lot of my materials, uh, my material IDs, right? The same thing would be in, in Painter, you know, how you bring in a model, you do a bake, uh, an initial bake, and it sets up, you know, you set up all your maps into the same slots. Um, and then it shows it in its renderer. Um, of course, you know, you probably go to the layer system inside of uh, Substance and you actually click, you know, a color selection and that color selection lets you take advantage a lot of, of the same maps. So there's a little bit of a different setup method for, you know, adding smart materials and or base materials to each part. But in, in Quixel, generally, I just hit C and let's say if I want this chest area here, I'm just going to hit shift on top of that. So I click it, and this dialog box will come up, which will be all of the list of smart materials, right? Now these are preset materials that are pre-baked uh, pre out, you know, um, you know, they have, you know, their own normal map and data, uh, color data, and of course, you know, roughness and metalness values, uh, and a lot of those you can customize and change, right? So let's say if I went and wanted to put something a little bit general, I'll go over to metals, uh, maybe military metals or something like that. Uh, black, so black oxide is good enough. I'm going to put this on his chest, right? And so it's going to go through, uh, and what it does is it sends a lot of scripts to Photoshop uh, to go through the process and manage more, fi or probably more layers than one can humanly parse out by themselves, right? So, you know, for what used to take hours worth of work, it crunches it and does all the scripting and gives you the layers, merges them down in masks so that you can get your material on. Oh, I wonder if something went wrong here. Did something go wrong? Why is it showing me the base creator? I've already created maps. Uh, I'm going to close this. There we go. 
for some reason it was giving me the same dialogue for a bake, like an all-new bake. But here is your project. Um, one of the things you might want to do, as I was mentioning before, is adding other maps so that you could see with entirety what you've got going on. Um, as far as details and whatnot, I'm going to go to Add Map. That's this little dialogue button off here. And once with this menu, Add Map. So there's other maps that I'm going to use in my project, like um, let's say first would be the bump. And for some strange reason, I made the mask, but it doesn't. It's not showing where it applied it. So I am actually just going to come over here and reload this and refresh my view and see if 3D will catch up. Yep, there you go. So it just didn't update the map. This material has a little bit of edge wear, so you, as you can see within that black oxide, it uses the curvature to go along the ed edges and put like a slightly different material, which will probably show up like a like a roughed uh, metallic edge wear shape. Uh, and then of course it's got some grime, sort of grimy scratches and whatnot. Perfect for something like this, right? And so I can keep going down the line and looking at you know different color maps, clicking them and applying you know materials similarly so, right? And each time you can see here in this black thumbnail, this is basically your mask. So uh, I'm gonna hit yes and enter the Dynamask and hit yes. I can literally also paint on top of these uh, materials right so if let's say if I wanted to use a different uh, material on this this is actually you know what if I wanted to reset my my curve or something like that or if I wanted to add like a dust and dirt um, or rust I could you know easily come in add a mask or add a curvature and it adds that that dust dirt curvature texture to my maps and so like basically if I wanted to turn that that texture into a dirt or something like that or a dust it basically just changes my mask and applies it there so basically I'm gonna close this uh, and not accept that mask Oops, sorry get a little tweaked there close it and it'll probably revert it back there we go but for now, before I get in too hard into, you know, actually how to customize the materials, I'm just going to place a few and I'm going to actually check check them. So the way to set this up so that you can really view it how it should be intended is I'm going to take this model and I'm actually going to just come over here to the main dialog box and I'm going to open up the exporter. And so which means that inside of the directory that gets made for this bake, uh, it's going to save it in the flats folder and I'm going to export all materials, right? And don't worry, if you saved one project, it's probably not going to overwrite if you do another bake of it. Uh, so any previous bakes that I have, it's made a new folder and directory for all of the mapping. So I'm going to use those maps instead of my already pre-established done maps uh, for this guy. So I'm going to close this there, and we've exported. And I'm going to bring this over to Marmoset. So actually, let me just go ahead and close this guy. Save. I think uh, I don't want to tax out my GPU too much. Uh, we'll just go down actually and open up a new Marmoset toolbar. All right. So again, I'll hit Control I, and I'll bring this over. I'll grab. I think this is our model here, right? And as I bring it in, you can see it's probably smooth. It doesn't have like a lot of detail at all. It's actually an entirely smooth, smoothed out mesh. This is because, of course, I had saved the original uh, OBJ or FBX with smoothed normals turned on, right? And now, of course, if this is the Unreal template, uh, I'll just uh, actually I'll delete this one and just bring in a fresh one. Oops, not titanium. Sorry template and I'll click and drag this material I have it I can save it and rename it but for now just need to double click it and also 
uh, click and drag it over to the model so you can apply it. Uh, I'll just say test material, right? Now, click this, click here, and inside of that thumbnail, I should be able to have my new folder, I believe, which is this. Or no, wait, that's not it. Uh, O2, maybe? Flats, that should be it. And I was looking at normal, so I'll grab that. Uh, I'll grab the roughness. go so you see how it went from a very high shiny metallic to sort of a roughed out matte metal uh, and then I'll put a uh, metalness map in here metallic All right it changes it even more it's more of like a matte white now and then albedo All right and so now we have just this singular map right I haven't really placed anything in the sky to make this brighter, so it looks a little darker than it was, but really, it's just the same way. So now, I can go in, of course, I'm going to go down the line and just add up some of the base maps that I have. I'm going to add my AO to occlusion. And so you notice then, a lot of these lines became a lot sh sharper, the shadows uh, some of the like detail recesses, uh, little you know divot holes and stuff like that. A lot of it became a lot sharper, right? And so now all we have to do is worry about lighting this thing. So we've started to texture it. Uh, you could do the same thing within Substance, right? Uh, if you output from Substance and uh, bake everything out, it's going to give you you know your new maps and everything that you can set up in exactly the same way here in Marmoset or in Unreal, right? So now I'm just going to go to the sky, and I'm going to pick something interesting, maybe something with some interesting lighting. Uh, I like to use uh, this uh, Bologna portico here. It has some nice uh, orange lights in it. And I'll go and I'll just select a few hot points just for their value. I'll get something maybe over here. There we go. that on the back so here it still looks a little bit dull but if I take even just like the hottest lamp and I click on it and figure out which one it is I think this is uh, probably what was that the third one and I could crank up the brightness a bit there we go and I can put some distance to it or make it uh, a little bit closer I can add some contact refinement and this is where you can probably see a lot of details in the map, right? Turn it around, a lot of those dust and scratches. Uh, still probably have to save it again and get a little bit more bump out of it. You know, maybe I can adjust the bump a little bit and get some more details out of the scratches and whatnot. But uh, it works great for just, you know, sort of generalized uh, look development. And on a lot of these materials, you can click into their folders and change specific elements. Like, uh, I believe... This one here is actually a grouped folder. If you uh, enter the group, you can actually go to the grease element and dial it down, or like the black oxide, make it maybe darker, or the steel base. Like if I wanted to bring up the specularity of this steel base, I would just use the Photoshop picker, bring it up, hit OK, and it makes a lot of those metals a lot tighter. Uh, I can also, let's see use maybe a few other customs and whatnot like uh, let's see I'm gonna go exit out of this group and hit all and when I'm on the top here I'm gonna go to albedo and I'm gonna hit C again plus shift and let's say for example like I wanted this material plus the arms to be the same so what I think is you need to do is this if I remember the hotkeys correctly um, I can hit C and then instead of shift which would add a new material to it or smart material to it what I'll do is I'll actually hit uh, control and click on an additional group and it should add it to that mask All 
right? So now his upper body has all one material, right? And whatever I change with the groups inside of this material, it'll apply it to all everything here on the hands. Let's grab some fingers. No pun intended. Well, that's like an old kid joke or something, right? actually added it oh well that's fine so you know here again in the fingers you know where there's a lot of detail around like a lot of the knuckles and the shell for the digital of the fingers that are supposed to look like a, a mech hand um, I actually borrowed this mesh from the mesh that I sculpted up for uh, Goro the fellow with the horns uh, and it worked out for both cyborgs it gives them sort of a, a matching similarity or similar manufacture type of vibe um, you know, there's a lot of contours in the bodies and stuff like that, and so it just made a nice fit. But let's go ahead and, of course, come down here and hit the exporter. And we'll bring this up again, and I'll click it again. Sorry, it's being a little slow with Photoshop. Come on, click it. There we go. Exporting is generally a lot faster than saving it out because the to save out this project is actually going to be saving out each and every one of these maps. So behind this previewer, like if I was to move 3D aside, these are your maps and what they look like. So for every masked area, you're going to have like that curvature and texture and those scratches applied, and everything with the layers is handled, you know, through scripting with Photoshop, right? Uh, actually not that, sorry. Uh, here is what I wanted to show you. So this is the actual layers file. And if you look at a lot of these, these are all of the masks, all of the settings. They're coded out probably for a, a naming convention that uh, Quixel uses. So it would be hard to navigate through a lot of these. So the front end of the, uh, the, the interface is, is pretty helpful in, in bringing up, you know, uh, all of the areas that I need to work in without having to worry about you know all of the higher technical issues right so using this with ZBrush is great because I can use ZBrush for all of its sculpting and then come in here and quickly you know put some you know real world like PBR textures on things um, you, you could probably do the same if you have 3d coat maybe or um, you know substance I think substance is probably the most popular um, you know texturing tool right now out there uh, so you know uh, that user base is probably pretty high but between Quixel and Substance you could do about the same thing I as a personal preference like uh, working with Quixel because I, I'm very used to uh, a the Photoshop uh, interface but I, I go both ways on that one uh, so uh, you know more power to the both of them right so okay so I've exported that and now once I've got those maps exported, if you see me come over here to our Marmoset project, that will happen. And along with that bump being turned on, see now you have in a lot of the materials all of the little pits, you know, all of the weathering um, that was in the bump map is now being mixed in with the normal and giving you a lot of higher detail, right? So that's kind of the cool part is that you can get some really high detailed maps uh, in here very quickly you know uh, to sort of you know sort of look develop your your character right and all of the base uh, details that are in your normal map give it a lot of the shape the illusion of the shape right so literally also you know without using uh, color IDs I can also go into uh, Quixel and hand paint inside of certain areas if I wanted to by just defining that inside of the mask inside of the Dynamask uh, so, you know, get your tablet out, you can actually, you know, paint on these models almost similarly like you would almost a, a poly paint, but in this case, it's actually working in the, the physically based render map areas, right? It's applying the albedo, you know, the pre-calculated normal and also metalness and roughness maps, right? Mixing them all together, and then finally, you know, here on the model. So again, I can flip back over, uh, add just another material like uh, 
let's say just uh, lastly for this demo sake and then I want to move on to some other things in our last half hour um, but these things I'm going to be talking about more in the future unfortunately I think uh, for some personal reasons I'm gonna have to take some time off from streaming just a little bit so I hold this I hope this stream holds everybody over but I will be back soon uh, to continue on hopefully so here we go I'm gonna just show you that and then back over to our Photoshop once I can bring it up Oh, I wonder if it crashed. Did it crash? That would suck if it crashed. Let me see here. Oh, nope, here it is. Sorry, it just was hidden. Okay, so back here, and then I'm gonna try and maybe crank up some of the light in here because it looks a little dark. Uh, some of the default lighting, usually the direct light, uh, light intensity is about set at default at one. Um, but you can flip through this and see a lot of your different maps. PBR shading being at the top, albedo or just albedo, um, selectively, roughness, metalness, not much to see here. It's probably just going to look mostly like a black map, but some of the values in grayscale are sort of hard to make out sometimes, but a lot of these maps generally will have some black or gray values in it. Uh, normal detail all put together. AO, and I'm sure you could probably make some adjustments to these if you wanted to. Um, I think you actually have to add an AO map to probably change some of the AO in here. So let's try that out, actually. Add a few other maps. Uh, I would like to add a, a cavity. It's usually, I think in PBR, probably a lot of people don't use it as much, but I like to combine AO with cavity after the fact. Um, sometimes just to give it a little bit more richness. Um, especially when I'm messing around and tweaking things, because I, I can noodle with it, things forever in Marmoset, you know, never be satisfied, but get pretty close to what I imagine I wanted. Uh, add another new map, and maybe you might want also emis emission. Emission is actually something that's kind of funny to use um, here in Quixel. Uh, sometimes, confusedly, you can select a couple of other maps. I figured that if you use an emissive material and then take the opacity while on the tab and actually turn every other uh, map off uh, as far as opacity goes, so in other words, if it's not an emissive going into a one specific space, I would take the opacity and turn it down all the way to zero. Uh, so that way, nothing else is shiny except for the designated area, right? And what I have is, I have this little dot to fill with this white emissive material. Or on this map, it's actually going to show up as white every time I look at the map now, right? Uh, in fact, if I go PBR shading, oh, well, maybe not. But uh, you can view your emissive here. And then probably make a material or add a smart material. So if I go here, add smart material, and I think there's one called window. Was it window? I think it was window. We're gonna check and add it anyway. And I'm gonna add that map while having the emissive tab clicked. Go, 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 go. So let's see if this works for example sake. So I'm going to turn the dirt off, right? And I'm going to keep this clean layer of window here there, right? Uh, and then with the window, I'm actually going to click on the color and I'm going to change it. I'm going to change it to sort of like a yellowy orange. Something that will get hot if I turn up the uh, emissive intensity. I'm going to click OK. Right? And so this basically essentially, um, just kind of like Mike showed in his video, this would be the emissive material. Right? And of course I have a mask space here. So 
basically, I'm going to go back to all. And on the mask here for this one, I'm actually just going to take this bottom material, which is the rest, change the opacity. Sometimes this can take a second to calculate, but I'm going to hit zero on it and hit enter. And that's only turning the opacity down in its emissive space, right? So now I'm going to come back up to window and I'm going to click on its Dynamask and edit Dynamask. Uh, it's going to ask, would you like to paint in full shaded mode? Click no for a quick editing. Uh, I'm going to say yes in this case. And what I can do is in the mask itself, instead of using my color ID, if I wanted to, I could just come in with a small brush. So I'm going to grab my styles here and get ready on the pen tablet. go and I'm gonna make this mask black from start which should make my model look normal again instead of this bright you know orange there yep so everything in this map is gonna be black and then what I'll do if I can see this right uh, that's the emissive Let's see here. I might want to go into options and under the render. No, actually no. Field of view, mesh centric, all groups. Wanted to take a look and see if I could turn on my wireframe so I can see exactly where I need to be. Um, because this is actually in a full paint mode. It's the, the mask is black, um, but I actually literally need to paint in um, everything in you know the, the, the exact spot where I have um, my emissives coming. So I'm just going to go to albedo, or actually go to PBR shading, right? No, nope, go to albedo, right? Uh, and in this mask, I'm just going to try to see if I can put solid dot. So I'm going to flip back over to this tab that says painting. I'm going to get this brush out and I want this slider to be exactly like that, which would be white. I'm still operating within the emissive space even though my PBR shading is elsewhere. Uh, and I'm going to bring this down a little bit, make it teeny, teeny tiny little dot, right? Uh, and then what I'm going to do is check on the symmetry button, go here, hit X, turn, just sort of line this up. And so now when I paint on this thing, it should be happening on both sides. So I'm just gonna make a little eye dot here, right? And then I'm gonna hit PBR shading and go back to my emissive. So that would be my color. Uh, it looks like I hit one of the sides of the objects there. So I'm just gonna erase that little overage Clean it up. There we go. Yep. Two little eye dots with that orange in it, right? And I'm going to turn symmetry off and, of course, accept the mask. It's going to fake it out. Take a second to do so. It's baking. There we go. I've still got to go back to all. I'm gonna click on albedo and go back to all. So there's my window material, which is an emissive material that has the eyes and our black oxide, which is basically the skinning of uh, the guy's chest and arms. And I'm gonna hit PBR sh shading, and you're gonna see this. And so it doesn't look very lit right now, but I know that it's there, and that's that's great. So normally, as you saw with the other um, final maps that I created, um, it looks like most of the other head has other materials on it, uh, and I did that, you know, sort of just so that there would be some material breakups and whatnot. So I'm going to go back to here, 
and I'm just going to click on uh, export one more time get the exporter out export all materials and then it'll go through every, all of the maps and materials and export them in one single go come on don't be so slow come on there we go Hui. do it export it there we go it's going to take a second again And so literally, if you in the case of illustration, like all of the bump uh, material on here and all of the rendering that will, goes into sort of like the edge wear, I can actually make these accurate to how they are and the, how the lighting is, um, you know, just by putting in some uh, smart materials and getting a different, you know, nice little collection of materials. Some of them I might edit. Um, those are details that I don't have to spend time painting later um, if I'm doing like a key visual or something. I just have everything there in 3D and then I combine a lot of 2D methods along the same with that. So for future tints that's something that I'm going to have to try out is um, showing you guys just like a, an overpaint of something um, you know from 3D elements. Um, but I've been doing a lot of the asset building um, more than almost the painting these days uh, because I'm trying to actually create a lot of like motion projects. So now that we've exported that I'm going to flip back over. It's going to spin there an update, probably a bit. And you would look at this and say, okay, well, we've got our lighting, we've got our textures on his chest and arms and fingers. Where's our emissive, right? So let's just bring these shadows over on one side, this profile. Make it sort of dark there, sort of ominous. And then, of course, I have to skip down here, and there were a couple of other maps that I added. So I'm going to go and get my cavity that I now have. Right. That makes it a little bit darker because in the recesses of things, it's actually adding a more a darker color, and I can bump up the exposure or basically turn this dat diffuse cavity down a bit. You see how it changes some of my metal uh, and general lighting. Um, but of course, you know you could mess with these sliders and get different results. But uh, more so, I'm going to come down here to emissive and add my emission map. I'm going to click here, mesh emissive, open, and now we have our eye dots in, right? And so with this, basically the color, I can turn up, you know, sort of a more saturate, like intense color, and I can bring this intensity up, and there's our guy's eyes, right? Dark and ominous, love it. He looks so brooding. You know, he's got that future future angst going on. You know, I mean, shit. If you got blown up and got your body replaced with something that looked like a futuristic cockroach, I think you'd be pretty pissed off. I, I don't know, just me, just what I'm saying. But anyway, in all in good fun, yeah, that is your emissive map, and then I just continue on until I have all of the other maps done going down the line. Um, and then of course, you know, there are some other advanced ways of painting up custom materials um, that I would love to show you with this. And just briefly so that I can kind of cover it just a little bit. Uh, let's say for example sake, um, I want to create a custom material for the sash uh, or the obi. Uh, this is like a clams, I think they call it, a, in Japan they call it a clams mouth, mouth fold. Uh, I found a cloth object um, kitbash. Uh, from long time ago that I had. Um, it's probably made in, in, in Marvelous Designer in the earlier days of Marvelous Designer. But it, it made such a nice uh, sort of clams mouth, you know, shape, you know, like a like a sash that it would be cool to add in with like, you know, leather cargo pants and sort of give them this, you know, future vagabond kind of look. So uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna just come here to the main dialog box and I'm going to come to this layer where it says add clean layer. And a clean layer is basically a layer that doesn't have anything in it, right? So I'm going to click it. And of course, I'm I'm operating with the with the albedo space in mind. And it's probably going to go on the top of this layer here. So above this group of where it says window, which is the material emissive for the eyes. And it's going to look like everything in your 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 maps had been blanked out. And you're going to go, "What the hell?" Why, why is everything, you know, gone? 
So basically what this is, is this is a clean layer that's not set up so that you can just come in and create a new material. It has the actual texture or load material, and then it has the actual edit down mask, and then it actually has edit reflectance, which is the actual color value of this thing, right? So just for color value sake, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to actually pick like sort of a pale mustard color maybe, you know, something that looks like dark. Uh, Japanese cloth, maybe, maybe uh, what is it, darpaline or turpaline, I think is the type of fat mesh fabric, um, and uh, maybe an olive drab or something, a little bit more yellow, but right here in the middle, not too hot, and I'm going to hit OK, uh, and in this Dynamask, I'm actually going to click it, again paint in full shaded mode, And once I'm in this painted mode, I think you guys are going to probably understand a little bit more what's going on here. So it's probably going to bring that mask, uh, the mask properties or the Dynamask Editor back up. And it's Dynamask Editor Color Fill, sorry. Uh, and if I hit blank black, everything's going to go, right? And then we're probably going to get back to a state where we had our previous textures, right? So basically what this did is it just filled up the mask with all black. So now what I can do is I can actually hand paint, you know, or put in like, you know, different material breakups by whatever I define, you know, on the model itself by painting it. So I'm going to Alt, Middle Mouse, Toggle In. It works, the navigation is just like, say, you know, most 3D apps based off of like, kind of like the Maya style navigation. But now what I can do is I can hit this paintbrush. I can go and I can actually pick a brush, so I'm going to hit like just a hard round, uh, no shape dynamics for now. Uh, don't really need it for this, I'm just going to work a solid because I want to work in some solid areas. Uh, maybe I want to paint these little bolts here or something like that. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll just turn up the transparency until it's absolutely 100% hard. Symmetry, so that I get the same thing on the other side. I'm going to bring the brush size up just a bit. And I'm going to tap here and just sort of add some, some material breakup colors, you know, like maybe I'll circle that dot. And even if I go over it, it's all right because I can come back and sort of clean that mask up. Or let's say, for example, maybe this plate here on his forearm. I think that would be good for this material. Here and I'll paint right over this. There we go. I'll just sort of block these things in. Don't have to be super particular about it. Whatever the fill is, I can come back and sort of clean up some of the edges and make it blend a little bit better. Right? I'm going to actually go to my eraser and do the same thing in the reverse. There we go. Make this a little bit smaller. I'm going to hit shift and left click, or excuse me, right click bring my light around so I can see this a little bit better. So that looks like it hit the mark pretty okay. Maybe dance in and around the edge here and just sort of clean it up. With the brush, there we go. So basically you're just painting on your own mask in areas, right? I'm going to cut this guy out. Yep, there we go. Uh, maybe fill in these. This here, just in and around there. One more time. Being a little careful. And of course, just like Photoshop, um, when you're painting in 3D, just like this, 
Uh, the brackets work for the size of the brush, just like uh, regular brushes do in Photoshop. So you can hit open bracket, close bracket to get larger and smaller. And I'll just paint, keep painting right on the model. And I'll do the same to add the regular brush. There we go. And so now, I think that looks pretty clean. Yep, I think that looks pretty clean. So I'll just take that plate and um, I'll turn off symmetry again. And, you know, I can, I, as I said, I could use this as dust or something like that. So what I'll do is I'll go back to my mask editor. Sorry, bring, bring this up. Bring this up a bit. Sometimes this UI moves around. I think when things get a little heavy in Photoshop, it starts to maybe slow down a little bit. But what I want to do is actually just click on Accept Mask. And in the small little tiny thumbnail, you will actually see it right there. See those little pieces right there? <clears throat> those white dots actually represent the unmasked area. So basically what you're doing is you're sort of just painting on uh, a mask essentially with a material behind it, right? And I can come in now and I can take this and, you know, change this mask again if I wanted to or change the color. Uh, maybe, you know, I want something of a more gray color. You know, just something on the side of his arms. Maybe a little bit darker. That way. Yeah. Um, I can add another material on top of that. And once I comprise a, a couple of different materials, like let's say if I wanted some edge wear, the next clean layer that I build on top of this, I could add a mask that just has dust. Um, so let's just make like another one. And usually these things take a second to... Uh, actually no, this is not tool bag. Um, I'm working in between tool bag and using Quixel Suite 2 inside of Photoshop 2018. Uh, or CC in 2018. Sorry, Warsol, I didn't see your your answer until now. But uh, I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna continue on doing this next time around. I think I've actually run out of time here at the top of the hour. But then what I was gonna say is, um, just in this next uh, clean layer, what I would do is I would add, you know, a different mask, and I'll say yes again for painting in the shaded mode. I'll just finish off the look to show you guys how it works. Similarly, so again, you know, you can do these sort of things in inside of a, you know, Substance Painter. Uh, sometimes I believe within uh, ZBrush there are some ways to sort of trick some of the maps into doing sort of the same flow. Um, at least baking your your basic procedural maps from ZBrush, you can also do that. You know, if you're working with you know, nicely done topologized, uh, you know meshes you know that are in full quad uh, with no problems you can bring those into your 3d package and set up uh, probably before you go to that 3d package you could do color IDs by just merging it and then putting on all the meshes you know just a colorized uh, ID and once you have that map baked out you can use it in the same fashion as a as a masking uh, tool right so I'm just gonna in here I'm gonna use something like um, dust Create some dust effects. And it'll work along the curvature. Uh, and then, actually, let's say on this ambient occlusion mask, I may actually use this as a linear color dodge. And I could maybe invert it. There we go. So at least within the inner edges of these is where you get a lot of that dust detail. And if I change this color to maybe something darker, I can get some dark dust or something in the cavities a little bit more. Might have to scale that texture down a little bit. Or something light. Let's try 
sort of reddish color. And naturally, yeah, you can see sort of the dusty haze of some reddish dark gray here where I inverted and linear masked. Uh, linear, I think it was like a linear dodge in the AO space and that can become a detail and basically what I would do is I would just take uh, these two hit shift and select both of them uh, and then hit the folder here which will basically group the two together and that will become a map All right. or at least a, a material sorry alright so I hope that gives you a go I just wanted to uh, show you guys as well uh, there's a few clips that I've created these here sort of giving you some some idea of the results of some of these maps right and the sculpts themselves that just came these are straight like dynamesh like really heavy dynamesh sculpts with a little bit of bashing glue. and uh, using instill LED I crunched those down did some uh, texturing and quixel suite um, and then bring them over for a render inside of marmoset where I can use a variety of rendering techniques to actually get these sculpts to look a lot more interesting. Applied with movement, uh, different lighting schemes, different HDRIs, and the animation will play out and cycle inside of a previewed uh, MPEG-4 or like movie clip file. And let's see, I'll give you another one just for example's sake. Here's one that I did in which I have a cyborg that was totally a diamond sculpt, crunched down, fully textured. Maybe there's a few spaces where I need to fill some gaps in between the legs. But you could see just from the lighting scheme, the fog, and the materials, how dramatic, you know, you know, you can get your characters to kind of look once you develop them, right? Alright guys, cheers and thank you for joining me. I hope I didn't go over too long. Um, have yourselves a good weekend and appreciate your time as always. Thank you also to Pixelogic for hosting uh, these demos uh, and to ZBrush Live. Uh, have a good weekend guys and I hope uh, all of the techniques described will be very helpful for you, you know, once posted on uh, YouTube or whatnot, you know. If you have any questions or anything, ask me. Uh, I'll try to get or you know, follow the, the YouTube stream and, and answer questions post haste. And uh, yeah, great, awesome. Thanks as always, guys. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Have yourselves a good weekend, and bye bye.